If you want to destroy the Khilafah, okay, you have to make sure that it cannot be restored. How can you take the entire world of Islam with so many ulama and ensure that not only is the Khilafah destroyed, but it cannot be restored? That's a tall order. <laughs> How to do it? The answer is you not only have to liberate the Haramain from the control of the Khalifa in Istanbul, but you have to put it in the control of those who will not themselves claim the Khilafa and will not allow anyone else to claim the Khilafa. And so long as these people keep control of the Haramain and the Hajj, the Khilafah can never be restored. Simple, isn't it? Simple, isn't it? And so that is why they had to make the trip to Riyadh to meet. What's his name? Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud. Correct name? Of course it's the correct name. Why are you afraid to mention it? <laughs> but Ablaziz ibn Saud did not control the Hijaz. So he couldn't command the check for seven million pounds. Huh? He had to be content with something less than that. So what the British offered to him was if you would sign the same kind of agreement with us, and violate the specific command in the Quran and betray Allah and his messenger and betray the Ummah if you will do that we pay you 5,000 pounds a month would you accept that? Abdul Aziz says yes yes <laughs> and in 1916 Abdul Aziz ibn Saud signed an agreement with Britain yes which made of him a military ally of Britain, subservient to Britain. But when the Ikhwan, who were his military force, questioned him, how can you sign this agreement with Britain? And how can you accept this money from Britain, 5,000 pounds a month? Abdul Aziz ibn Isha'u says, this is jizya. <laughs> Jizya is what they pay to me because I control them. <laughs> it was dust in their eyes and they swallowed it. And so Abdul Aziz ibn Saud got away with it. Massive betrayal and a very dangerous plan is now in place. As soon as the Khilafah is destroyed, that Abdul Aziz ibn Saud will be given what is known as the green light, something that Saddam Hussein knows about, the green light. And then he will attack and take control of the Haramain. And when once he does that, he won't make the mistake of ever claiming the Khilafah for himself. And he will never allow anyone else <laughs> to claim the Khilafah. Because no one else can take the control of the Hijaz and the Haramain from them because they are supported by Britain. And so goodbye to the Khilafah. It's gone. It can never be restored. Never, never, never be restored. So long as Britain and the United States of America underwrite the security of the Saudi state, you can never, never, never restore the Khilafah. By 1919, the Ottoman Empire was in shambles, falling apart. And a British army under General Allenby, with many Arabs and Punjabi Muslims fighting faithfully under his control, attacked the Turkish garrison which was defending Jerusalem, defeated it and liberated the Holy Land. 
This was a joyous day for the Jews because now the countdown is really moving forward and the golden age is coming back. In the same 1919, when the Ottoman Empire is collapsing and it is losing all its non-Turkish possessions, all the Arab parts of the Ottoman Empire are falling away, the Greek army now invades the Turkish mainland, Anatolia. And the Turkish people now have a tremendous fright in their hearts because the Greeks hate them with a PhD in hatred. <laughs> so Britain now has to create a Turkish general who would appear to the Turkish people as a savior who has come down from the heavens with his hands resting on the wings of angels to save the Turkish people. And so at a place called Gallipoli, a man named Mustafa Kemal inflicts a defeat on the ruling state in the world, Britain, and immediately climbs the ladder to become the hero of all heroes in Turkish history. Very convenient, isn't it? Mustafa Kemal now takes over. He is in fact de facto, de facto ruler over the Ottoman Empire. And the Khalifa is just a piece of furniture. In 1920, I think, or 21, there was a big treaty, uh, negotiations in Versailles. And from this emerge now the Turkish Republic, which replaces the Ottoman Islamic State. But Mustafa Kemal said, the Turkish people love their Khalifa. So if Europe could have a Pope, why can't we have a Pope too? This was simplistic thinking on the part of Mustafa Kemal. If the Europeans could have a Pope, well, so too can we. So the new Turkish government of Mustafa Kemal decided to take the Khilafa and remove from it all political authority and make the Khalifa the equivalent of the Pope. This was 1922. And things were going fine for him. Turkish people were happy. Khilafa is still there. And the leadership of the revolution in Turkey were very happy because we have a secular state now, a model after the European state. But in 1924, on the 3rd of March, suddenly Britain demanded, of course, this is secret, they wouldn't reveal it. Britain demanded of, Ottoman, of, of Mustafa Kemal that he must abolish the Khilafah. The demand came from Britain. And on the 3rd of March 1924, the Turkish Republic abolished the Khilafa. The question we have to ask is, why did they do it when there was no need to do it? Nothing. It, it represented no threat whatsoever to the secular Turkish Republic. The answer for the abolition of the Khilafa on the 3rd of March 1924 is located in a place called India. But even the Indian scholars of Islam are not aware of it. <laughs> even they are not aware of it. When the attack on the Khilafah was taking place in the 1916, 17, 18 period, then Indian ulama, at that time the Indian Muslim community was one of the most influential Muslim communities in the world. And the Indian Muslim community was led by leaders who knew Islam and lived Islam. Hmm? Men like Maulana Muhammad Ali Jauhar, Maulana Shaukat Ali, Maulana Sayyid Suleiman Nadwi, Mufti Kifayatullah, men who knew Islam and lived Islam. And they wanted to get rid of British imperial rule in, Britain, in, in India. 
so that when they got rid of the British they could restore Islamic rule over Muslims that's all they wanted get rid of the British and restore Islamic rule over Muslims and they realized that they could mobilize the Muslim masses of India over this issue of the Khilafah because everybody loved the Khilafah and so they established a movement which they call the Khilafat movement Haratul Khilafah Harakatul Khilafah the Khilafat movement when they established the Khilafat movement and it began to mobilize the Muslim masses the body which was sleeping is now waking up for revolutionary struggle to preserve the Khilafah in Istanbul the leader of the Hindus realized but wait a minute the Muslims want the same thing that we want we also want the Hindus we want to get rid of the British and we want to restore Hindu rule over the Hindus so there's a conversion of interest here so Gandhi who later became known as Mahatma Gandhi Gandhi approached the leadership of the Khilafat movement and he said to them listen the same thing you want the same thing I want so why don't we join forces will you allow me to join the Khilafat movement and guess what the leadership of the Indian Muslims did it was revolutionary theory on their part and we praise them tonight they admitted they accepted the offer of Gandhi and they formed an alliance and so the Khilafat movement in India now became a Hindu Muslim alliance for the purpose of getting rid of British rule and then that would replace that with which would replace British rule would be Islamic rule over Muslims and Hindu rule over Hindus this constituted the most dangerous of all threats that Western civilization have ex ever experienced in its entire period of colonization of mankind this Khilafat movement because the Western objective was to demolish every existing state structure in the world and replace it with the secular state so that the eventually the secular state could be brought under the umbrella of a League of Nations and eventually a United Nations and this would be political globalization at work hmm? if the Khilafat movement were to succeed then one of the most important communities in the world the Indian Muslims will escape because when the British withdrew Muslims will be ruled by Islam and Hindus will be ruled by Hinduism between 1920 and 1924 the Khilafat movement was building up steam at an alarming rate and by 1924 the British had calculated we have to get rid of this Khilafat movement and the only way we can think of now is to abolish the Khilafat and so they put the pressure on Mustafa Kemal as soon as the Khilafat was abolished the Khilafat movement in India began to lose steam in the same year that it was abolished in 1924 in that same year the secularly minded British uh, in, Indian, in Indian language they call it Chamcha <laughs> the stooges of the British in India the brown skin Englishmen parading as Muslims hmm? of whom the prince of them all was the grandfather of the present Aga Khan Karim Aga Khan's grandfather they now restore an organization called the All India Muslim League huh? the All India Muslim League is led by men who don't know Islam and don't live Islam and these are the people 
who now wage a struggle for the liberation of the Muslims from British rule to be replaced not with rule of Islam oh no but rather by the rule of the secular Republic of Pakistan and the secular Republic of India so that Pakistan and India could be embraced within the community of secular nation states but of course you had to put a little red herring to fool to fool the people so you have to make it appear as though Pakistan is going to emerge as an Islamic state but that's just dust in their eyes to fool those who see with only one eye and so in 1924 on the 3rd of March the caliphate was abolished when the caliphate was abolished Sharif al-Hussein realized that he was in grave danger now so long as there was a Khalifa in Istanbul the British needed him <laughs> but now that the Caliphate was destroyed abolished Sharif as Hussein now realizes the plan he says oh my gosh they're going to send Abdulaziz Ibn Saud to cut my throat now in exactly the same way that Abdullah of Jordan is now realizing as soon as Bush attacks Iraq that is the end of me Mm -hmm. so uh, Sharif al Hussein decides four days later on the 7th of March 1924 to claim the Khilafah for himself but when you're a client state of Britain you can't do that you have to first apply to the British government for permission <laughs> to become the Khalifa mm -hmm. he didn't do that as soon as Sharif al Hussein claimed the Khilafah for himself on the 7th of March 1924 you're going to get all of this information in that book which is outside the Caliphate, the Hijaz and the Saudi Wahhabi nation state as soon as he did that Britain gave the green light to Abdul Aziz attack within six months the Saudi uh, the, uh, 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 army of Abdul Aziz ibn Saud conquered Makkah and Abdul Aziz uh, and Sharif Hussein packed his suitcase and off he went British took him away this one the Americans will take out of Jordan and so Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud is now in control of Makkah and eventually Medina it's a Saudi Wahhabi alliance does he claim the Khilafah for himself now? no what he does is as soon as he enters Makkah in 1924 October Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud makes a proclamation and they're going to hate me for revealing this to you because nobody remembers it now the proclamation which he makes is that this land belongs to the entire Ummah huh? this land belongs to the entire Ummah I wonder how a Pakistani or a Bengali Muslim will feel when he hears that and he's been rounded up like dogs stray dogs and put on trucks because he's overstayed his visa while white skin Americans and British are treated like princes in the Holy Land how would a Pakistani or Indian or Bangladeshi feel this land belongs to the entire Ummah and it is for the Ummah not for Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud for the Ummah to establish the government which will rule over this land that is his proclamation in 1924 but in cricket it's called playing for time he did this because in April of 1924 Al-Azhar University had responded to the Turkish abolition of the Khilafah what did they do? Al-Azhar University declared that this was bid'ah and haram to abolish the Khilafah hmm? and therefore we must respond to it and the response of Al-Azhar is that we must have a Mu'tamar a conference which would meet and which would appoint a new Khalifa as soon as Al-Azhar issued this proclamation you could see how Britain was trembling the British government can't digest their food now 
They got to plan some counter strategy to the initiative of Al Azhar University. The counter strategy is that Egypt is itself not a free country. It may appear free, but Britain really has control over Egypt. So Britain puts pressure on King Fuad, the father of King Farouk. You're too old to hear about. You're too young to know about this. And King Fuad, uh, Fuad is now putting pressure on Al Azhar to hold back on this conference. Hmm? So for two years the conference can't take place. Two years because of British pressure. The conference finally takes place in June, July of 1926. But Britain uses another counter strategy. She gets Abdulaziz ibn Saud in Mecca to also convene a conference of the world of Islam in Mecca at the time of the Hajj, which is May of 1926. And then Britain and Russia and France and China and all the major powers in Europe all get to work massive intervention in the affairs of the world of Islam to ensure that the Cairo conference does not succeed in winning a representative gathering and that the Mecca conference gets all the Muslims attending it and they succeeded the Cairo conference organized by Al-Azhar University becomes an essentially Arab conference because non-Arabs are hardly present the conference met, the conference decided that the Khilafa was an essential part of the deen, that it was bid'ah and haram to abolish it, that the Khilafa must be restored, but we don't know how to do it. So let's go back home and come back after one year. That was the decision. We don't know how to do it. But in Mecca, you had the most successful representation of the entire world of Islam because Britain really went to work on it this conference is now convened but strangely for the Wahhabi movement strangely for the Wahhabi movement which is a religious movement which declares that it is bringing back the original Islam and removing all the extraneous things which had been added and cutting out all the shirk so this is the real Islam well then how come you don't even have the subject of the Khilafah in your agenda for your conference we ask the Wahhabi movement give us an answer there is no answer the answer is that the Wahhabi Saudi Alliance is now perpetrating a gigantic, a massive betrayal of Islam in abandoning the Khilafah. And so the conference takes place. But the subject of the Khilafah is not even on the agenda of the conference. Instead, Abdulaziz ibn Saud approaches the conference twice himself in person and he asked the conference to recognize him as al-malik <laughs> that his rule should be recognized over the hijaz when the conference had heard his majesty the king on both occasions and the conference is now sitting down to discuss the matter Shall we recognize Saudi Wahhabi rule over the Hijaz? The leader of the Indian Muslim delegation jumped up to speak first. He spoke first. His name was Maulana Muhammad Ali Jauhar. He got up and he told the king, get lost. We'll never do that. As soon as the leadership of the Indian Muslim delegation had established his position of rejecting the claim of the Saudi Wahhabi leadership for sovereignty and control over the Hijaz, the rest of the delegates couldn't say, mm. that was the power of a man who knew Islam and lived Islam. 
And so the conference ended without giving to the Saudi Wahhabi rule over the Hejaz recognition. They decided that they'll meet every year, but that was the last time they ever met. This then was the response of the world of Islam to the abolition of the Khilafah. In 1930, I think, or 31, Hajj Amin al Hussein in Jerusalem felt that the ominous advance of the Jews in the Holy Land required a response from the world of Islam. So he sought to reconvene the conference in Jerusalem. But it, it was a new conference. It gave it a new name in 1930 or 31. They call it the Al Aqsa Conference or the Mu'tamar al Am. And this conference also met in 1930-31, but you meeting to establish Darul Islam in a territory which is under British rule. Nothing could be more foolish than that. How can you restore Darul Islam when you're meeting in a territory which is under British rule? And you, get a, you have to get permission from the British government to hold your conference. So the conference ended without being able to do anything about it. Since then to this day, there has been no effort no significant effort on the part of the world of Islam to restore the Khilafah. Why? Simple. Because you cannot restore the Khilafah unless, unless and until you can liberate the Hijaz, Makkar and Medina. You can't do that. When the Hijaz, the security of the Hijaz is underwritten by Uncle Sam. What is the Replacement of the Khilafah around the world, beginning with the secular republic of Turkey, and then an Iran which resembles a Shia republic, but essentially is a secular republic. And then the secular republic of Pakistan, which of course has now become the American republic of Pakistan. And then in 1933, the Republic of Saudi Arabia, but they're parading as a monarchy, but it's actually a secular state. Because what, it has all the trappings of a secular state. A secular state has territorial sovereignty. The state of Saudi, Saudi Arabia has territorial sovereignty. A secular state has citizenship. Once upon a time when I went to Mecca, I was Muslim. And the only difference between me and my fellow Muslim was resident in Makkah was that I was Musafir and he was second. Hmm? Other than that, we're the same. But now, I am a foreigner. If this is not Bid'ah, I should change my name. I am now a foreign national. And they are Saudis. And all the oil that Dajjal discovered underneath the soil belongs to them. They own it. So what about Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud's proclamation that this ever entire land belongs to the world of Islam? That's forgotten. That's why they hate me for reminding you of these things. The entire world is now embraced, the entire world of Islam is now embraced by the modern secular state. 